Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that introduction, Colleen. And uh, thank you all for joining. I'm really excited to talk to you and hear back from you as well today. All right, so as previously mentioned, today's presentation is going to be focusing on three specific topic areas. We'll be talking about masking, uh, ventilation, as well as testing. So our masking se section is really gonna focus on different types of masks, right? Uh, we've been hearing more about this recently. So what are they and how should we use them? Before, but before I get into talking, um, like I said, we wanna hear back from you guys. So I do wanna, um, if Colleen, you wouldn't mind launching that poll. Um, mm -hmm. We have a second poll to kind of gauge um, your use of masking in the daycare centers. Here is the next poll. And again, if you if there's a response that's not included here that you might be using, please feel free to just jot it in the chat box. That's fine. And also just a reminder, I think this uh, poll is uh, intended for our daycare centers. Thanks, Maureen, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got about half of the daycare uh, participants responding. I'll give it another two seconds or so. Okay, looks like we've pretty much paused there. I will uh, excuse. Awesome. Okay. All right. Marie, you'll see the responses here? Yeah, I do. Thank you. All right. So it looks like we have um, a mix of things going on. Looks like a lot of us are wearing um, surgical masks. A lot of us are wearing cloth masks, um, a smaller amount who are double masking or wearing um, N95s, KN95s, et cetera. So we'll talk all about that as we go through these next slides. All right. If this could just advance for me, that'd be great. There we go. All right. So as I said, there's lots of different options. Um, so let's get talking about what they are and why they actually matter. Um, so starting off with the basics, our masks are made to contain droplets and particles that you're going to either breathe out, cough, sneeze out, etc. Um, if they fit closely to your face, they're also able to provide you some protection from the particles spread by others, including the virus that causes COVID-19. Um, Respirators are made to protect you by filtering the air and fitting closely to, to uh, sorry about that, on the face to filter out particles, um, also including the virus that causes COVID-19. Similarly, they can also contain the droplets or um, particles that you're breathing out yourself. Now these different options can provide different levels of protection depending on the type of the mask, how they're used. Um, there's many options. They range from loosely woven cloth masks to tighter fitting N95 respirators. Um, we'll be talking about the differences in these options over the next slides, but I kind of want to start with saying that any mask is really going to be better than no mask. And we'll talk about ways that we can make what we have available to us work best for us. So you might have heard the terms high quality mask, um, or you've read articles titled how to choose a better mask, some similar things are along those lines. So what are we talking about, right? Um, generally those articles and these titles are talking about respirators that filter a high percentage of hard to trap particles, including the virus that causes COVID-19. Um, the most commonly available or uh, the ones you probably have heard of include N95s, which is the US standard, as well as KN95s, KF94s, which are international standards, I'm sorry, equivalents. Um, we'll get into the differences between these three, but in general, these higher quality masks are going to be made with filtering materials and they're going to be elect electrostatically charged uh, to attract um, and trap these hard to trap particles so that they can't enter into our bodies when we breathe in and also protect those around us. Really, the critical factor with these are going to be having a good fit. These are all designed to uh, fit snugly against your face and create a seal. Um, that seal really prevents air from leaking in um, so that all the air you're breathing in has gone through that filtering material and you're protected from COVID-19 or protected from anything else um, that might be in the air that the respirator is able to trap. Um, without that good seal, they can't offer their ideal protection since air can just come in, go out the sides, um, the tops, the bottoms, wherever the openings might be. So when they're worn properly and without gaps in any 
sorry, without any gaps. Um, these masks can effectively trap those particles um, as well as other contaminants from the air. So that's why they're recommended. Starting off with N95s, which you're probably gonna be familiar with, um, N95 respirators are approved by NIOSH and are evaluated against a specific US standard that also includes a quality requirement. Um, these are what medical professionals are going to be wearing when they're taking care of COVID-19 patients or in, if they're in otherwise uh, risky situations, perhaps performing COVID testing, et cetera. Um, if you think back to you know, spring 2020, you probably remember the massive shortages we had of N95s and kind of the request to not wear them because we wanna save them for um, people who are in those higher risk scenarios taking care of COVID-19 patients. Um, however, over the last few months, both the supply and the availability of N95s have thankfully increased um, to the point where uh, we're starting to talk about more people wearing them. Um, now, NIOSH approved N95s filter at least 95%, but often a much higher level of particles in the air when you have that proper fit. So when you're wearing them correctly, an N95 respirator should be able to protect you pretty much entirely from COVID-19, um, or sorry, the virus that causes COVID-19 and therefore the disease. Um, now, again, getting that fit, that's the, that's the key part here, right? So N95s, um, to help achieve that fit, they're gonna be available in different styles um, and different sizes to accommodate users. Uh, you can kind of see here on this slide, there's two different styles of the, of the N95 here. They can look pretty different from each other. And there's really not a one size fits all option. Um, there's some that fit most, but um, there's always gonna be exceptions. So if you find yourself with an N95 and you can't get that seal, um, you might wanna consider um, you know, either trying going up a size, down a size, or perhaps using a different type of model. Um, you just really wanna make sure you're getting, it's sealing on all parts of your face and there's not gaps in there. Um, to help achieve this, they also have straps that go around the back of the head as opposed to ear loops, um, like some other masks. And um, they also have a moldable, um, you know, little bridge of the nose um, tool that's usually metal or some similar moldable um, material that helps achieve the good fit. Um, again, you're gonna have to make sure you're using both straps to achieve that good fit. Um, and it really assists when you're wearing it properly. Um, it's also important to note that N95s are only approved for and tested on adults um, and that any workplace that is providing their workers with N95s or requiring N95 should have an OSHA, um, sorry, shall have an OSHA respiratory protection program. Uh, moving on to other types of tighter fitting models um, that are available. There's the KN95, uh, most commonly made in China, that also filters 95% um, of hard to trap particles when it's worn properly and it's well fitting. Um, the KF94, that's the South Korean equivalent, some differences. Um, they both have ear loops instead of hat, head straps. So a snug fit requires finding a mask that fits you well. Um, because, you know, loose ear loops or any ill-fitting uh, face piece can really uh, decrease the effectiveness of the mask considerably. Um, similar to N95s, KN95s, KF94s, those models are available um, in different sizes. There's different models, different companies who produce them. Um, children's sizes are available in some of these models, um, which is a difference between N95s. Um, all that considered, again, because they have ear loops, it can sometimes make that proper fit more difficult to achieve um, if you have a model that's too large or too small for your face. So it's really important that you're making sure the one you've selected um, is appropriate for your face and you can um, do so by checking the seal around their face and there's making sure there is no gaps. Another really important note about KN95 specifically is that there's a lot available out there and they're probably one of the more common masks you'll see um, is in terms of you know, these three that we're talking about behind surgical and cloth masks, because um, they're easy to find, but the market's abundant with counterfeit KN95. So um, if this is an option you're looking into, I really want you to do your due diligence and uh, look at the product you're buying. And we'll talk a little more about red flags in the next two slides, but 
Um, legitimate KN85s are going to be stamped with the manufacturer model, and um, it's going to say GB2626-2019, um, which is the standard they're made to. It, if you see one with dash 2006, that's just an older, um, the older version of the standard. Uh, KF94s tend to be a little less susceptible to counterfeits compared to K95s, but I'm still going to recommend you really inspect them because that's there's no guarantee that's always going to remain the case, right? Um, you're going to want to check for a product that's made in South Korea where they're where they are regulated. So when it comes to purchasing N95s or international equivalents um, and trying to avoid counterfeits, making sure we're getting the real deal. Um, I highly recommend sticking with reputable suppliers. Um, think about your well-known big retailers. Think about Home Depot, Lowe's, Granger, even some of your larger pharma, uh, pharmacy chains, et cetera, familiar brands that generally work directly with suppliers. Um, alternatively, you can also look into purchasing the product from the supplier directly. So brands like Honeywell, GM, um, there's other makers of these um, masks and different models. So I recommend doing one of the two. Um, use caution with big online retailers. They can be really tricky because there's counterfeits and legitimate masks really mixed in. Uh, and it can be really, as a consumer, it's really difficult to spot the difference and sometimes impossible because sometimes a product listing could list to multiple suppliers and one can be legitimate and one can be fake and it's just the luck of the draw what's gonna end up on your doorstep. So um, just use caution with that. There's things you can do to help find the right one, but um you know just just be careful so when your item arrives um or if you're able to see images online you want to inspect it make sure it has the proper markings so if it's an n95 look for the niosh um, and the other things that are on this slide um if the slide's a little small for you it will go out in um, the materials afterwards and uh, you could also see the link at the top to read this more carefully what you should be looking at for an n95 and as i mentioned there are certain things that should be uh, on a KN95. Uh, KF94s may not have markings on the mask itself, but you should be checking for, um, you know, it being made in South Korea, as well as for the lack of red flags, which we'll discuss on this slide right here. Um, so some red flags for counterfeit products to look out for might include a uh, lack of company or location information, um, a lack of expiration date, um, they need a expiration date because the electrostatic charge um, and other materials that you know basically hold the mask together may degrade. Uh, packaging should be clearly labeled. It should describe the product. Um, if you order off of you know online and you receive a brown box with a non-labeled plastic bag close by a zip tie, I would say you have some pretty good reason to be suspicious that you have a counterfeit. Um, you also want to watch out for things like grammatical um, errors, misspelling, typos, things you would normally look out when you're trying to inspect if any product's legitimate or not, right? Um, as we mentioned before, N95s are approved by NIOSH. Um, surgical N95s um, and surgical masks um, may be FDA approved as well. Um, but you do want to look out for uh, inappropriate te terminology. So if you see uh, NIOSH stamped on a KN95 or a KF94, that's another, um, you probably don't have a real product or at least a real product, but not a legitimate KF1095 or KF94. Um, also just a note that um, the term FD re FDA registered, that's an actual label, but it does not indicate that the products reached a necessarily a high bar. Um, it simply means that the manufacturer has registered their item with the FDA. Um, as opposed to where NIOSH is uh, going out and, you know, testing and verifying the claims of the product. Um, lastly, keep an eye out for quality issues, um, crooked or missing nose bridges, um, loose straps, loose ear loops, uh, tears um, when you open the package, um, and also making sure that the, the model you get is consistent with what you expect. Uh, for example, if you're expecting an N95 and it has ear loops, uh, you know, that's inconsistent with what you would expect. All right, moving on to, um, moving on from tight fitting respirators, um, surgical masks are another mask option. Um, they're made of pleated synthetic material um, and they usually have three layers. Sometimes you'll see ones that have two layers. 
Uh, they're loose fitting and they expand to fit the face and they're generally uh, more comfortable for longer term wear and more widely available. Um, even though they're not tight fitting, um, they are loose fitting and they're not designed to create that seal. It's still really important that we get a good fitting mask for our faces, right? Um, there shouldn't be big gaps on the sides of the face, the top, the bottom. Um, most of them do have um, a nose bridge that you can adjust down. We should be using that. Um, a lot of times when they're too large, you'll see really large gaps on the side around the cheeks. So um, if that's the case, you want to consider switching to a different size, a different model, um, or sometimes with these masks, um, you can achieve a better fit by knotting the ear loops or um, adjusting them somehow. Um, they're going to be less protective than tight fitting masks, but they're generally more protective than most cloth masks. Speaking of cloth masks, um, cloth masks are quite popular. Um, and along with surgical masks, it seems to be what most people are wearing in daycare centers. Uh, they can be found pretty much anywhere. Uh, many companies have branded them, provided them to staff, et cetera. Um, and cloth masks are important, they do, and can offer some level of protection. However, the concern a lot of times is that they're really highly variable in the amount that they can filter out um, and highly variable in their fit. And they often generally um, provide lower protection compared to surgical masks um, and certainly less protection compared to tight fitting models. Um, if you're looking for a better cloth mask, the best ones really have two layers of a tight knit fabric and have a filtering material in between those layers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, if using cloth masks, staff should be aware that they should be well-fitting um, and multi-layer to offer um, protection. A really easy way to kind of increase the protection that a cloth mask does offer is to use double masking. Um, so to do double masking and to do it effectively, you want to place a well-fitting cloth mask over a surgical mask. Um, and this helps. Um, it helps more than just a cloth mask alone because a, it provides a different uh, additional layer of protection, but mostly it also helps um, helps the fit of the surgical mask and the cloth mask with both of them together, um, kind of reducing the gaps around the mask. Just a note here, um, you don't want to rely on masks that have um, ex ex sorry guys exhalation valves because they're going to um, negate that protection that the mask is providing to others. All right, sorry about that. Um, so how should we wear our mask? Whatever mask we're getting, again, the key is going to be the fit of the mask. I can't emphasize this enough. Um, if the mask or the respirator does not fit well, you're not going to be well protected. Uh, large air, large gaps allow air to get in and they can really greatly reduce the level of protection that whatever you're wearing is able to offer you. Um, I recommend that to increase your protection, you consider using surgical masks or um, surgical mask plus a cloth mask, so double masking, as opposed to just using a cloth mask alone. Um, masks should always be you know, thrown away if they're damaged, um, if they get really dirty, if they become difficult to breathe through. Um, to avoid that type of damage, I you know, store your mask properly. Um, if you have uh, N95 or any equivalent respirator, um, avoid the temptation to throw it at the bottom of your bag at the end of the workday. Um, a lot of people store it in a, uh, paper, a brown paper bag to protect it. Um, so we want to make sure that what we're wearing is, you know, of the proper quality and we're taking care of it. If we're using surgical masks, just replace them as needed. Um, when it comes to the kids in our classroom, uh, there's no universal solution for which mask is best for children, right? Um, I'm sure you guys all know this more than I do, but for younger children especially, the best mask is one that they're gonna be able to keep on and wear consistently. Again, surgical masks, great options, and they may offer additional protection than cloth masks. Um, and with any option you use, you, you wanna see a mask that fits the child's face, that it's gonna stay up while they're moving around, while they're doing their activities, et cetera. Um, and that they can keep on. Um, it's, you know, we recognize that this is probably an ongoing every day challenge. Um, a, a challenge to find something that fits the children well, 
um, something that the child will keep on. You know, we recognize this and we know that achieving the perfect mask with a child, it, you know, it's not always the most achievable, uh, achievable goal, um, but we do want to emphasize finding something that can at least be consistent for children to wear um, and they can consistently wear something that fits adequately. Again, remember any face covering is better than nothing and the best mask is um, just for staff and for kids. It's gonna be one that fits well um, and that they can wear consistently. Uh, there's options that offer better protection, um, but there's a lot of other factors that come into our everyday lives and the ways we need to work and uh, the ways we need to protect ourselves. So um, just wanna kind of get that out there too. That's great. Thank you so much, Marie. Um, so before we move on to the next section, I just wanted to take a minute and ask, especially those of you in daycare, but certainly local health departments as well, if you have comments on this, do you have any particular successes that you might be able to share? We'd kind of like to use this space, if okay, to, as a bit of a learning space as well. So if you do have any successes that you can share with your colleagues, please take a minute to just add those into the chat box. And likewise, you know, if there's any particular struggles that you're trying to deal with, you know, if we can't find some answers for those and Marie can't respond, um, then we will seek out additional answers if needed. Um, but we would just like to try to gather some of that information. And we'll just give you about 30 seconds or so to do that. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Valerie. Showing pictures and success, success stories to the kids. Nice. Yeah. Mask holders, that's a great one. Nice. Great. And also, if you have any particular struggles or challenges, feel free to add those in. And while folks are adding some more, oh, great. Thank you. We see some more. Um, I'll go ahead and get ready for the next poll. Marie, unless there's anything in particular you'd like to comment on at the moment, or do you want to save that till the end? To the um... No, I think we could save um, that to the end. I think we're getting some good stuff in the chat box. Um, I actually did just see a question pop up. How do you train a two-year-old to wear one? I think, uh, I can't imagine how difficult that is. Um, and, you know, it's not about getting it perfect from the day they turn two years old. Um, it's more about getting them used to the environment, finding something that's comfortable for them, um, you know, using some of these tips that are coming through in the chat box um, and getting that consistency down. Great, thanks, Marie. And I do encourage you all to kind of take a peek through that chat box because there really are some nice suggestions coming up and they may be helpful to some of the others who are struggling a little bit. Okay, so as we go into the ventilation section, I'm just launching a new poll regarding ventilation. Again, this is primarily for daycare centers to respond to this. And if you don't see um, the response that fits how you're dealing with ventilation or trying to address it, please use the chat box and you can just type a response in there as well. Great, we have a lot coming in. We'll give it about 10 or 15 seconds. Awesome. All right, so it looks like we kind of have a, a mixed bag what we're all using. I'm sure some of us are using um, a few options. Some of us might not have all the options available to us um, for things to increase ventilation. Um, but it looks like we're getting a pretty good response and you guys are uh, doing a lot to help do that. So let's talk about it a little more, right? Let's talk about ways we can um, increase our ventilation, why we wanna do it. Um, and hopefully some of you guys can get some more ideas or at least some more background information on why it's important. So kind of to start off, um, the safest indoor space is going to be one that is well ventilated. So it's constantly having cleaner air, come in, so outside air, replacing the stale air inside. This is because bringing in that outside air um, is going to dilute the indoor air that might contain the virus. Um, it might also contain other contaminants. Um, so it could reduce the exposure of anyone inside. So how do we achieve this in the classroom? Um, really the simplest way, um, it's free, is, well, you know, 
free to do so. And then we, we deal with the things that we have to do to uh, work with it. But if your classroom space has windows that can be opened, that's a really easy solution to bring in more clean air and increase the ventilation. Uh, we understand that, like, for example, right now we're in the middle of uh, well, early February, right? It's the winter. Um, it might not always be comfortable to do so. In some cases, it might not be safe to do so and open the windows. Um, so, you know, understanding that, I also do want to point out that opening the window a crack, um, opening the window a little bit from the top, um, that is going to be more helpful and bring in more outside air than just um, having the window completely shut. So if you have the option, if you have windows that do open, um, doing a little bit of something is better than nothing to help increase the ventilation in the room. Um, and if you're able to open them and you have enough room to use fans safely, uh, use child safe fans, this is one thing you can do that can really um, increase the effectiveness of open windows. Um, if you're doing so, you wanna make sure that you're positioning the fans to blow out the air. Um, so bring out the air that is in your classroom and allow the air from the open windows to come in. You wanna avoid blowing air around the room without bringing in fresh air. Um, it's all kind of about getting this directional airflow, right? Anything that might have COVID, go on out. Anything that is fresh air, clean air, come on in. Um, in commercial buildings, outside air is usually pumped in through um, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, or HVAC, HVAC systems. Um, so even if your building does not have windows that open, I know a lot of us who are in you know, newer buildings or really any commercial buildings, a lot of them don't have windows that are easily opened or able to open at all. Um, you still have the ability to change your mechanical ventilation system to increase how much um, clean air it is pumping in. So a few things you can do to do so is, um, and I would suggest you do this working alongside your HVAC professional, whoever services your system. Um, first of all, making sure that service is occurring and it's occurring, it's up to date. I um, mean, it's meeting all the requirements um, for a building um, that is of the size of whatever building you're in. You also want to see if you can set your system to bring in as much outside air as possible. Um, so systems might have settings that allow additional um, outside air to be breathed be brought in. Um, understanding, once again, just like windows, there might be conditions, outdoor conditions that don't make this possible year round. But then again, a little bit of something is better than nothing, right? Um, if your system uses something called demand controlled ventilation or DCV, um, this is a uh, system where it controls the airflow depending on you know, times of day and occupancy. So it can reduce the airflow um, during certain times of day when it doesn't need to be as high. Um, you wanna disable that because it, you, know, you don't want anything reducing that airflow. You wanna have it working as optimally as possible at all times. Um, one other thing you can do is upgrade to a MERV 13 filter in your system. Now MERV stands for, you don't have to memorize this for any reason at all, but MERV stands for Minimum Efficiency Reporting Value. And it's essentially a rating that reflects the efficiency, which a filter can collect particles in you know, different size ranges in a single pass as, it move, as the air moves through your system. The higher the number, the better filtration a room will have. Um, many HVAC systems are built to run on MERV-8 filters um, and lower number filters allow the air to flow faster with less resistance, um, but it comes at a cost. They're able to trap much less particles than a higher rated filter would be able to. So again, work with um, whoever services your HVAC system and see if it's possible if you can upgrade to a MERV-13 filter. That they won't be compatible with every single system, but they tend to, um, it tends to be an available option for a lot of systems. Uh, this chart here, it's, I won't get into it, but it does just show that how at different particle sizes, what um, the filter efficiencies will be. Now, if you're in a home-based daycare setting, um, your situation might be a little different. In homes, air, outside air typically gets in either through open windows, open doors, um, and some other you know, nooks and crannies, wherever you feel a draft is where the air is coming in. So you might have some less, you might have less control options than you would with a commercial HVAC system. However, you're more likely to have windows that can be opened and be opened safely. 
So um, one thing you can look into is if your home system has a fan setting that you can toggle between auto and on, um, you're going to want to set your fan to the on position when there's children or staff in the home. And even I would recommend doing it before they arrive and after they leave as well to kind of uh, flush out all that air. Um, and again, with filters, um, we also have filters in our home systems as well. So you wanna make sure that it's being properly replaced at the correct um, you know, timeframes. Um, and you wanna see if you're able to upgrade your filters. Now, a lot of residential systems are designed to work with a MERV five through eight filter. Um, so you might not have that option of upgrading to a MERV 13, but I would, if you're looking into upgrading the ventilation, you can, that's certainly an option to look into. Um, or even if you're using a five, you can move up to an eight or see, see what an option is to you, again, working with um, someone who knows the system. Now, say we've, you know, changed our HVAC systems, uh, we've either opened our windows or we're not able to, what other things can we do to kind of supplement um, increased ventilation? So if you're in a room that can't get enough outside air in, um, a common option and a, a good thing to consider would be a air cleaner, um, sometimes called an air purifier, sometimes called other names, but we'll call them air cleaners today. Um, and just to note, portable air cleaners by themselves, they're not enough to protect people from COVID-19. Um, they're best when they are used alongside other practices such as masking, which we talked about, um, source control methods, uh, making sure that people who have COVID-19 aren't showing up to our centers, et cetera. Um, but getting into what air cleaners are, there are machines that mechanically remove particles from the air um, using a filter made of tightly woven, woven fibers. Um, you might actually already be familiar with these because they're also commonly used to remove allergens from the air. Um, a lot of um, you know, people who have allergies or asthma might use them to make the air a little easier for them. So I would really consider using these, especially in areas where um, adequate ventilation is difficult, um, where you have larger groups or it's harder to get more air in, or even areas such as like nurses' offices or where you might have children isolating while they are waiting to be picked up because, you know, they're showing symptoms of COVID-19 or any other illness. So air cleaners, what should we look for in one? Just like masks, air cleaners are not one size fits all. There's some things we should look for. There's some things we should avoid. Um, so I've kind of divided into three things we wanna look for. So first of all, when it comes to effectiveness, we wanna make sure we're looking for an air cleaner designated as a having a HEPA filter. Now HEPA stands for high, efficiently, high efficiency particulate air. And this is a filter that is able to remove 99. 97% of those hard to trap particles in the air. Um, so that's really what we want our air cleaners to have. Um, you also wanna consider the size of the room, right? So the larger the room, the more air there is, the more people in the room, the more things we have to clean out of the room. Um, so some of those larger rooms might require either more than one um, air cleaner or a more powerful unit. Um, and to know if it's the proper size or if we need something more powerful, if we need a second unit, um, you'll wanna check something called the clean air delivery rate or the CADR. Um, this is a rate that um, should be on the box or the user's man manual. And the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers um, is going to recommend that you have a clean air delivery rate of, um, that is at least two thirds of your room's area. So without getting into any math or anything like that, you wanna you know, get a decent estimate of your room's area. And then when you're shopping for an air cleaner, you wanna find one that has a CADR that is about two thirds of that area. Um, so if things to consider with that as well is if you're in a room that has exceptionally high ceilings, some gyms, um, other rooms, um, that's going to really affect um, the number of air cleaners you might need or the ability of any air cleaner to effectively clean out that air. Um, so just that's a word of caution with those types of settings. Another word of caution is, um, I'm sorry, number three. Um, this one's more of a consideration, consideration or a recommendation, but I would consider a model verified by the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers 
Um, this isn't a regulatory body, but it's um, they do independent testing of air cleaners to verify the claims that the air cleaners are making. Um, so if you look on your screen, there's the you know the check mark logo that you might find on some air cleaners. If you if you see this, you can be comforted by the fact that it was tested by a third party um, and that the claims that it's making have been verified. Now, there's models out there that might be doing a great job at what they say they're doing, and they might just not have gone through this process. Um, but I just find this to be a little bit of a reassurance. Um, lastly, just a word of caution when it comes to air cleaners. One thing we really want to avoid is products that uh, generate ozone, and that's either going to be intentionally or produced unintentionally as a byproduct. Um, ozone can be an irritant and it's especially could be harmful for um, young children. So we really wanna make sure we're avoiding that in our classrooms. Um, so what you wanna look out for is anything labeled a ozone generator. That's something that's intentionally producing ozone. And we wanna make sure we're not using those. Um, you also wanna keep an eye out for devices that are gonna be um, called ionizers or electrostatic pre precipitators, um, even some devices um, that they use UV light in the device on the floor to help clean the air. Those can sometimes produce ozone as an unintended byproduct. Um, so I would be very careful with those. And I, we wanna stick to um, air cleaners that are using mechanical means and that's that HEPA filter to clean out the air. All right, so that was a little bit about ventilation and kind of similar to masks. Um, we'd like to hear what your successes with ventilation have been. Um, and then on the flip side too, any struggles you've had in the classroom, um, it'd be great to hear from you guys. We'll give folks a couple of minutes there while I get the next poll open. Okay. Um, Maria is going to address in her next section the rapid test access and access to testing for your center. So if you could just mm -hmm. take a moment and do this last poll for our daycare providers. We'll give that another five seconds. And I'm just looking at the chat. Actually, we have some um, a comment about ceiling fans um, that Megan has put in the chat. Thank you for that, Megan. She's also with our center um, about how um, they're not going to be the best option for bringing new air in. So we want to think about what options can help bring new air into our rooms. Um, so open windows, um, our HVAC systems, et cetera. Great. I think All we're right. done with the poll, Marie. All right, great. So moving on to testing. It looks like some of us have had some difficulty getting tests um, in the past, and we're having a little bit of a better time now, which is great to hear. So we'll just, um, with this last section, kind of talk about testing and what our options are. So the first test um, testing option that we're um, able to use is PCR testing. Now, PCR testing actually detects the virus itself. Um, it most common, commonly uses a navel swab, um, but you also might see some that use a saliva sample for this test. Um, in both cases, there are some kits available where the sample can be collected at home, but they're always processed in the lab. So even if you're doing an at-home PCR test, it's just the collection that's occurring at home. The actual test is being conducted in a lab. Um, if you've actually utilized the New Jersey, the free vault test, you were sent a test, you were able to, um, they helped you collect a saliva sample and then you sent it off to the lab. PCR tests are more sensitive than rapid testing and they can detect the virus early on before there's a significant immune response because they're actually looking for the virus itself. Um, another thing to note about PCR tests is that they can conduct uh, detect the virus itself for a long time and remain positive for a long time after um, infection. So we're seeing that sometimes up to 90 days. Therefore, um, they're not necessarily a effective return to work um, strategy to require negative PCR tests. 
Moving on to rapid tests. So rapid testing is actually detecting the protein that's created by the immune system in response to COVID-19. Um, they're not detecting the virus itself. Um, they also utilize a na nasal swab. Results are usually available in between 15 to 20 minutes, depending on the test you're using. And they can be used for infants and children. They're often performed um, at home, sometimes at a doctor's office or at a clinic. I think we're, we're all seeing the rise in uh, at-home rapid tests. And um, a lot, it seems like from the, from the poll, a lot of us has been utilizing them. One thing I'll note while I'm on this slide, we're looking at pictures of some uh, commercially available tests. Um, one thing to be really careful about is that they're usually going to show a positive via um, a line or, you know, a plus sign. Um, really look carefully when you're taking these tests. A really faint line um, may occur and that if that occurs, then it's still detecting the presence of those antigens. So you're still considered a positive, even if the line is faint. So just make sure you're giving a little squint and checking to make sure there's no line there. Um, again, with um, rapid testing, the positive rapid tests are highly accurate and can be trusted. Um, and negative rapid tests, they're still very reliable, but they might be less um, reliable than PCR results. And this is because that rapid test taking early in the, or sorry, in the early or the late stages of the virus's progression may not come back as positive despite having the infection. And this is because they're, they're measuring the, the response of the immune system. So once you have the virus in your system, it might take a little bit for your immune system to ramp up its response. And then you know that's what the test is actually detecting. So that's why you might see a little bit of a lag when it comes to positive tests where a PCR test might come back positive or rapid might come back negative if they're taken on the same day. So if that's the case and you are symptomatic um, or you've been exposed, you might want to confirm your result with a PCR test following a negative rapid result. Um, again, uh, rapid tests are used for workplace testing programs very often just because of their ease of use and kind of the quickness of results. Um, rapid tests are great in the ability they give us to take a test um, in the morning, get a result and make our decisions based off of that. All right, so that was kind of a shorter section, but um, I'm curious to hear what successes and struggles you guys have had when it comes to testing, either deploying it in your center, um, you know, working with your staff, et cetera. Right. It looks like there are a few comments that have come in. Um, yeah, very, so I'm seeing PCR, maybe you I'm can take a look at those. Yeah. Yeah, I'm seeing some stuff about exclusion um, and PCR tests. Um, so when it comes to you know exclusion criteria and allowing um, children back into the classroom, um, we'll take note of that. I think that's probably better for our uh, DOH partners to answer. Um, for infant tests. Um, a lot of tests are recommended for two and up. A lot of times with infants, um, I would recommend that the child's parents are, you know, contacting the um, their healthcare providers to get the appropriate test for the infant. Okay, shall we go on to the next poll, Mary? Yes. Your final poll. Oh no, there's uh, the just this resources, and then I think we have. Go ahead, sure. Poll. Yep. Yeah, so just want to um, share here some resources that are helpful. Um, these will be sent out along with the slides. Um, and yeah, that's really it. I hope that this content was helpful. And Colleen, if you want to launch the final poll. Sure. Um, and I just, so I just want to remind folks, and Marie, thank you so much. That was excellent and valuable. Uh, I just want to remind folks that this was actually the first part of a two-part program. So. I just want to be clear that, you know, for some of the questions that you may have asked regarding testing, we will, our intention is to share those with our colleagues from the Department of Health who will be presenting on February 16th, and we'll be sharing that information with you for the next program. So, um, but in addition to the comments that you've shared here, 
we'd like to also make sure that we capture any other concerns you may have or any other specific questions so that they can be sure to address them in their presentation in the next couple of weeks. So um, if you can uh, take a moment and just for this particular poll, you're, you can select more than one. So you can select all that apply. And while you're doing that, I'll just answer these two quick questions in the chat box um, regarding CHES credits. When we send out the evaluation, you can indicate your CHES credits and we'll be sharing that in just a moment on how to do that evaluation. <coughs> And also, as you all, I think, observed, the program is being recorded and we'll share that recording as well. And I'll give folks five more seconds or so to complete this, um, the last poll. And with that, Marie, if you can go ahead and advance to the next slide, and I'm just going to, I think I can uh, just about pause this poll. Um, it looks like we have responses are slowing down a bit. It certainly seems like there's a lot of questions about isolation and quarantine. We know that's a question for everyone often, even still two years in. So I'm glad you addressed that. And that's an issue that many want to um, hear more about. So we'll be sure to share these responses with our colleagues on this for our program on the 16th. You can, um, you have a couple of options for doing your uh, evaluation. You can either hold up your smartphone um, it looks like there might have been a line drawn there. Um, hopefully that will still work, but if not, the evaluation link is also in the chat folder, um, in the chat file, and we'll also be sending out the link to all of you, for all of you, um, for the next program. So with that, thank you all, and Marie, thank you very much again for providing such valuable information. We really appreciate it, and we appreciate all of your time. Be careful driving home, folks. Take care. Thank you, and thank you, everyone.